Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session of the Coyote Logistics Digital Summit, what railroads care about and what you need to be a savvy intermodal shipper. My name is Will Benesso. I'm a senior campaign manager for Coyote Logistics, and I'm really excited that everybody could join. Uh, so in this webinar, you're going to get uh, an inside look at how railroad networks operate and how you can build an effective intermodal strategy overall. So today I'm really excited to introduce two industry experts uh, with diverse experience dealing with intermodal. Shauna uh, Fairchild, uh, Assistant VP of Intermodal with Union Pacific. Shauna, can you tell us a little bit about your background and current role? Sure, um, I've been with the railroad for 16 years. My current role is I have responsibility for our uh, intermodal sales team. So what that means is I have responsibility for all of our customers in international and domestic intermodal, as well as the premium space. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we also have Matt, uh, who's Matt Decker, who's the VP of Intermodal at, at Coyote. Uh, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about your background as well and working with Coyote? Yeah, thanks. Well, I've been with uh, Coyote for 14 years. Um, first uh, eight or nine years, I was in sales. And uh, since then, I've been uh, uh, vice president of Intermodal for Coyote. Current responsibilities are overall intermodal strategy and sales. So working with our customers as well as working with the railroads and our rail strategy. Gotcha. Cool. Well, thank you so much, guys, for, for being here today. Really excited to both, you know, have you both here to give insight into the industry as a whole uh, and really specifically get the railroads perspective on the current landscape. You know, I know that shippers often dealing with intermodal providers and not necessarily the railroads themselves. So really excited to have both of your insights. Uh, for today. So just to kind of take a step back here, um, you know, we know intermodal is a very important mode of surface transportation. And, you know, every savvy full truckload shipper has intermodal in their strategy. You know, but there are a lot of nuances, you know, a lot of procedures to understand with it. Uh, you know, and, and what you'll learn today, with what you'll learn today, you, you can be better informed and you know, ultimately a more successful multimodal shipper uh, and build out that strategy that you need. Uh, so today we're going to cover pricing, we're going to cover intermodal peak season, uh, we're going to cover current trends in light of the COVID-19 pandemic before debunking some myths about intermodal and then you know, kind of finishing it off with you know, leaving you with some great tips to help you inter implement a good intermodal strategy into your larger supply chain uh, strategy as a whole. So to kick it off, uh, just want to start out with a high level overview of the class one railroads in particular for good foundation. So Sean, I'll start with you uh, just to kind of you know, give us a kickoff here. You know, what is what is a class one railroad in particular? Okay, So railroads, you know, really, there's hundreds of them across the United States. Mm -hmm. And when you think about what a class one is, it's really just the largest. So if you think about the technical definition, I think it's something like um, a railroad that had over 250 million in annual operating revenue in 1991 dollars. So I think that really means something like 465 million dollars today. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, I've, I've heard there are a lot of different railroads across North America, obviously the world. You know, how many are there in North America? You know, and are there certain regions that they cover? Um, so as far as class ones go, there are seven of us. Gotcha. And there are certain regions. So the western half of the United States is where Union Pacific is located, as long along with uh, BNSF. And then the eastern part of the United States, you have CSX and NS. You have the two Canadian roads, so CN and CP. And while they're in Canada, they also have reach into the United States. And then you have the KCS, which kind of runs uh, north-south right down the middle of the U.S. Cool. Cool. It's very interesting. So. Uh, a lot, a lot of different, a lot of different railroads to to cover there. So cool. Uh, so, Shauna, I know intermodal shipping is just a portion of what railroads move on a daily to weekly basis to yearly basis. Can you give us a brief overview on some of the other products you guys offer? You guys move in general? Yeah. So, um, all the railroads are slightly different in how they're organized, but really we move the same things. And the Union Pacific, we're split into three teams. And so as you think through that, we have what's called our bulk team. And so bulk consists of grain, grain products, food and beverage, and also coal. Then we have our industrial team, and that really is made up of what you think it is, right? It's rock, it's forest products, it's chemicals, it's metals. And then you have um, the premium team, which is where intermodal resides, and then we also have automotive in that group. Gotcha. Gotcha. How, how much of uh, 
you know, how much of the network overall for, for Union Pacific is intermodal freight in terms of maybe a percentage or something like that? Yeah, so it's right around 40%. Cool, cool. And then in, in terms of you know how it compares to other products, is it is it high priority amongst the others or is it more of a growing offering? Is it more of a balance? You know, how, how does that work? Um, well, yeah, I mean, intermodal is a priority for us. Um, it's growing. So when you think about traditional railroads, I think a lot of people think of us as uh, you know moving coal, for example, and coal is in secular decline. But when you think about the intermodal space, um, things even like e-commerce and things like that, intermodal is a part of our business that's growing. So we really view it as a future growth engine for our company. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Shona. Um, you know, so now that we have that you know baseline of the railroads in particular, just want to talk a little bit more about how they operate, what the priorities are. So I want to start with a quick walkthrough of the life cycle uh, of the average intermodal load. So uh, Matt, I'll start with you. Uh, in terms of railroad operations in particular, what are the components of an intermodal load, you know, and the steps involving, you know, getting from the shipment from the shipping dock to the receivers themselves? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, for the, 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 the basics of intermodal load, you're going to have a drainment on the front end. You're going to have a, a container or a trailer that's going to move on the rail or, you know, the drainment is going to pull to the shipper. And deliver the receiver uh, and then you're gonna have a drainment on the the destination end with the railroad in the middle in, in their ramps um, those are those are really the components uh, you got a chassis so for the containers you're going to have chassis that those containers are going to move over the road on the trailers obviously already have wheels attached um, and then you have you know, from the railroad perspective you have the piece of equipment that's going to actually move the container or trailer so for in a, in a, for a container you're going to have a well car uh, which the containers are double stacked in and for trailers you're going to have you know there's several different names for them but you can have the flat car the spine car that they move the trailers on that um that hold the trailers uh those that, that's uh those are the basic components uh for the move uh and then there's just the coordination between them so the communication between the shipper and the and the um or the customer and ourselves which would be an, an imc and intermodal marketing company uh, you have the communications between us and our drayman, you know, us and the railroad um, on both ends. And obviously you're scheduling your pickup and delivery appointments. Um, and then one part, a component that isn't, you know, most people don't see when they look at intermodal is the blocking and bracing used inside the container or trailer to keep the product secure as it moves across the railroad. Gotcha. So I know you mentioned the intermodal wrap, ramp in particular, um, you know, for the audience, you know, may not know as much about that. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about what the intermodal ramp is? Uh, I, yeah, an intermodal ramp is where uh, the railroad kind of initiates an intermodal move. So it's going to be a terminal where they have uh, equipment capable of lifting the containers on and off the uh, the chassis and put them on the train, or, or vice versa, gotcha. off the train on the chassis. There's going to be siding where the railroads can obviously work the trains, uh, where you see the cranes kind of running over and along the track. And those are the ramps are typically attached to the main lines at some point. You know, the rail sides where they pull off. Uh, Sean is probably a little bit better equipped to answer that question for you, but uh, I don't know. I might have done all right. <laughs> I think you did great. <laughs> yeah. it's great, great. And Sean, anything else you wanted to add there? Um, I mean, just uh, once you think then about all the things that uh, he just discussed, you know, obviously once you get on a train, then as we move across to our network to the end destination, we do have our Harriman Dispatch Center that really watch how that train moves and communicates with it all across our network. And then uh, once you get to that end destination, you have kind of the reverse process that he just laid out for you. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. So, you know, I know we... Matt kind of talked to the, the intricacies of the of the shipping process for for that. I mean, in terms of the railroad perspective, you know, I know there's there's other terms like interchange and whatnot. You know, what's happening on on your guys' end? You know, what what does the shipper have to do? You know, to, in terms of connecting with you as well. Yeah. So um, I know you said some of your uh, participants today that are watching the webinar not, might not be as familiar with railroads. So I'll just step back really quick and explain what interchange is. Thank in you. super simple terms. Um, so when you think about it, you know, I talked about how Union Pacific, for example, is in the western half of the United States. So interchange really would mean, let's say that a shipper wants to get from LA to New York. So Union Pacific would take the shipment from LA to Chicago, 
where then it would hand it over to either the NS or the CSX to take it to your final destination. Now that can happen in a couple of different ways. So it can happen in what we call steel wheel interchange. And so that means it would move from us to, you know, CSX or NS via train. And then there's rubber tire interchange um, for less dense lanes. And so then what would happen is you would basically get that container back onto a chassis and it would be trucked over to the NS or CSX. And there are instances where the rubber tire move um, cross town is done by, you know, the Union Pacific, for example, or sometimes it's done by the shipper. Gotcha. So when, when you ask what they would do, there'd be some times where there might be a rubber tire move performed by a shipper. Um, the other thing really that they would have to do, I mean, it's simple. You would just build that interchange move. So. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. That's good to know. I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of you know different moving parts between you know obviously moving those shipments to the ports to the various destinations. Um, you know, from, from your mind, you know, what does it take to balance a, a network of equipment? You know, throughout all of those interchanges, all of those all of those different processes. Um, I guess I'm not clear on what you mean by balance. So. So just kind of understanding the the overall, you know, like, like where are the ramps located and, you know, being able to to kind of work with the other railroads uh, to be able to, you know, structure structure those interchanges and whatnot. Yeah, yeah so, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll answer that one for you, Sean. I mean, so when we, so the railroads have predetermined lanes that they operate in and will. So an example she brought would be LA to Chicago. Yeah. Uh, that's that's on the UP's core network, and then they offer also pricing that would be LA to maybe NS Harrisburg, which would be a ramp on the Norfolk Southern Harrisburg PA. And that, that there's we can either run it to Chicago and cross town it, like she said, or we can run it all the way through, let the railroad cross town it, which is your interchange in Chicago. But I, I think a lot of that is uh, it's all depending on where the shipper's shipping from and to where the railroads operate um, within the network. So if, if a shipper wants to ship from point A to point B, they come to us, we give them a rate based off the routing options we have available okay. to us from the different railroads we work with. We put the shipment together and we tell the railroads what how they need to route it. And that's the rail billing portion of it. So when they come and they, they want us to ship it, we say, okay, rail bill this one from LA to Harrisburg or LA to Chicago. From a, from a balance perspective, um in the network you know i think when you look at a network and balance it's a combination of all the different intermodal marketing companies asset-based imcs jb hunt schneider or swift and, and so on um you know it's all all the freight moving across country so it's it's imports coming in from overseas and being translated on the west or even east coast now it's shippers shipping from the east to the west or from the west to the east. So when you look at the entire network, balance is just a result of of how all the freight flows across the U.S. So, okay. and that's going to be dictated by demand. So as demand rises across country in different you know regions and effort, it will impact balance. If it falls, is it is it if it falls off, it'll it'll impact balance. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, no, that's great. Um, so. I think that's really interesting to know just in terms of the overall processes there. So you know, we, we, now we kind of learned a little bit about the class one railroads, the overall you know operations itself uh, and you know how the loads move. That gives us really good context to understanding intermodal pricing overall. So Matt, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, so what are the what are the specific components of an intermodal quote? You know, how does the drainage price, you know, from origin destination, um, you know, kind of tie into that as well. Yeah, so so typically the way an intermodal pricing is going to work for, that an IMC gives to a shipper is, you know, they're going to send over their origin and destination points and the volumes associated with those those OD pairs. We're going to go out and look at what's the best rail routing for that for that move along with drayage pricing as well. So um, depending on the different line hauls from the railroad. So your components of an intermodal rate are going to be your dray rate at origin, your dray rate at destination, your rail line haul, any acid soils that need to be built in, whether it's a drop or a live load, you need to build an extra per diem, which is the daily charge that the railroad charges us for the container and chassis. It's really a chassis rental fee as, long, as well as a container. Gotcha. Um, and anything else we need to build in, you know, plus, plus a fee. So you know, the way an intermodal load works and, and 
you, you look at that. So you got to look at all those components together. And sometimes, depending on what the railroads are charging from point A to point B, will impact what ramp you actually want to move, and as well as so will the dray rate. So um, some lanes actually you don't utilize the rail ramp that you would think makes most sense because of the combination of all the pricing. It's not the lowest cost option. And then there's also part of that is, is the days in transit it takes for the railroad to move. So when you're determining what line haul you want to use, you're going to look at transit time based off the customer's need. And that might impact what origin ramp and destination ramps you use as well. But those, those are your major components of a, of a rate for a shipper. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I know, I know you mentioned um, also, you know, per diem term as well. I, I know there's also instances where there's going to be intermodal drop pools as well. You know, do a lot of shippers take advantage of, of drop pools? Can you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, your your high volume shippers that have space are going to want to, you know, gonna want you to drop. It's more efficient for their loading. It's actually more efficient for our draymen as well. I mean, our draymen spend a lot of time, you know, on the road, inside rail ramps, getting equipment, um, and then at the shipper and receiver unloading. So wherever you can make that process more efficient and you can you know, reduce the dwell time for the driver, you know, is best. So dropping is, is important. It's also important, just as important, though, that that equipment that's dropped turns uh, pretty regularly. You know, it's not it's not meant to be, you know, for shippers and receivers to sit on that equipment for 10 or 15 days. They really need to turn in 48, 72 hours. And, and, and make sure your pool sizes are correct to where you're getting enough turns per week to keep gotcha. that winning. Gotcha. Okay. Good to know. Uh, so, Sean, I want shift to shift a little bit to you. Um, so, what are the different types of intermodal pricing um, that you guys have? I, I know in tr truckload market, we have the spot rates versus long-term contract yep. rates. Is that is that something you guys have as well? Yep, absolutely. So... You know, the way we define it really is we have two types of rates when you think about it, and that is our, um, again, committed rates or our, you know, our MCP program, and then we also have our transactional or our spot rates. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. So, I mean, in terms of in terms of an intermodal bid, you know, how would that work? What's the process and kind of interplay between the, you know, IMCs, the asset providers, shippers, and, and you guys at the railroad? Yeah. So, I can't go into a ton of detail. Um yeah. You know, again, around pricing discussion, but what I can tell you is that we work very closely with the IMC and the underlying shipper on the different uh, bid process, and we really work to find a package that works for all three parties involved. And so sure. that can be different, um, you know, depending on what it is, but I had alluded to earlier our committed program. So, for example, when we're looking at committed freight, we will work with the IMC and the shipper to say, hey, what's the base load going to be for, you know, the year? So what's kind of that level you're going to need and then we'll sign up for a commitment on um, box capacity and then there's also a year-round rate that would apply gotcha gotcha okay so i, I want to just take a kind of a quick step back here um i know uh, matt you mentioned imcs being those intermodal you know marketing companies in particular kind of like coyote um, you know, is there a little more information you know for any for any of the you know the viewers who may not know you know a little bit about what what those companies would, you know, kind of act as, you know, within this whole process. You can kind of tell a little bit more about that. Talk a little more about that. Yeah. So, so an IMC or intermodal marketing company is basically, you know, we we coordinate the move between the drayman and the railroad. Uh, the railroad works through the IMC community is what they call their channel partners. Gotcha. So they, you know, an intermodal product, which is different than the boxcar side of things, is they don't work directly with the shippers. They work through the channel partners. So the IMC community, which an IMC is, is basically, you know, we don't own the, you know, you can own assets, but we don't own the power most for the most part. You know, we're, we're contracting the power out. Uh, and in a lot of cases, we're using third party owned equipment. But it's really just a, you know, uh, I'm not going to call it a broker, but we're really just coordinating the um, each part, each component of the intermodal move, uh, and giving the shipper a signal point of contact. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. So, I, I guess just kind of shifting back to the pricing, you know, perspectives overall. I know, you know, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of differences in general between modes, uh, you know, for truckload and surface transportation versus intermodal. Uh, you know, how how does capacity and pricing, you know, how do you guys see the differentials there between, you know, 
something of you know intermodal intermodal usages and, and other kinds of surface transportation. You know, from, from our perspective, and the difference between you know a truck load rate and intermodal is you know intermodal is typically you're going to have one or two railroads that you're working with on a given move. Mm -hmm. Um, pricing is going to be a little bit more stable, uh, locked in, especially for a larger shipper. Uh, but you don't have the fragmentation that the truckload market does. The truckload market is extremely fragmented. There's thousands and thousands of players. Um, and you're, you know, basically your pricing for each carrier on the truckload side is dependent on their network and their supply and demand that they have from their customers. On the intermodal side, it, it's really you know, it comes down to how much freight is moving in that rail corridor, which is the origin ramp, the destination ramp. Um, what is the, how much volume is the shipper bringing to the table? And as, as long as your pricing is on, like Shauna mentioned, their MCP program is on a committed basis, your pricing is pretty stable for that 12 month period. It's, it, there's very little volatility into it unless something crazy goes on in the market and we have to utilize different ramps or utilize different, you know, alternative pieces of equipment. So I would say that, you know, in overall comparison to other modes, I'd say intermodal pricing is more stable uh, than uh, gotcha. workload. Absolutely. I agree with that. Gotcha. Cool. Um, so the only other thing I also wanted to kind of jump back to, I know we talked about a little more about the IMC handling everything in the shipment. Um, you know, shippers may not just may not know as much about you know, drayage and, and draymen in particular. Uh, you know, how do those differ from you know more of the long haul full truckload providers? The draymen, yeah, uh, going to run. So, people, you typically a driver that runs for a drayage company is going to be more uh, local to shorter regional runs. Those draymen expect to be home every night. Gotcha. Once they're out on the road. You're, you're starting at the rail ramp every morning and you're ending at the rail ramp every morning. You're, you're getting an empty container out of the ramp. You're going to the shipper, getting loaded, you're bringing it back. Or you're, you're taking a loaded container out of the ramp, going to the receiver and coming back. Whereas, uh, and so you're really, you're running out, you know, hour, hours of service have impacted the distance that Draymond will run a lot over the years, but you're, you're gonna run out 100 to 150 miles from the ramp and back in one day. Um, that, that's probably the biggest difference, you know, long hard. And the, the, what I will point out is the, the driver that picks the load up on intermodal load is not the driver or company that delivers it. So you'd be picking up a load in Los Angeles with one drayage company and delivering it in Chicago with another drayage company. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. So we have, you know, a lot of great insight on, you know, what a class one railroad is, you know, the, the railroad operations in terms of sh making shipments and whatnot. Uh, and then talking about pricing. So just want to shift a little bit more, you know, to pretty much what's been on everybody's minds for a number of months now, which is the, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. So, uh, you know, Sean, I'll start with you. How has how has the pandemic in, impacted the intermodal, you know, space in general and, and railroads in general over the past several months? Yeah, and it's been um, an interesting year and you can kind of call it the tale yeah. of two cities, especially when you think about intermodal. But um, Union Pacific, for example, our volume was down 20% um, really due to COVID. And so, you know, we had several months of the year, I would say it started, you know, as early as February because of the impact overseas, where you saw that because things were shut down over in China, for example, we weren't getting yep. any imports in. And then as it moved over here to the U.S., again, just experienced months of down volume. So what we were doing during that time, though, is that we were moving goods that were critical for COVID, right? So we were moving things like masks, IV bags, gloves, those types of things. But overall, our volume was down. Now, I'll tell you, um, it's not true for all of our lines of business, but Intermodal has come back with a vengeance. <laughs> so um, things have just really taken off. You know, when a lot of people talk about the record-breaking time period, the last time people talk about was 2018. And I can tell you that certain markets, specifically LA outbound, that uh, volume levels have been above 2018 levels. So a lot of that wow. um, this year, and it even started relatively early, I think was driven by some changes in people's behavior patterns, right? So if you think about it, as you look at all of us now, we're at home, everybody was shopping more online, you know, people that were on the fence about being prime members before are certainly prime members now. And I can tell you that e-commerce and parcel business, it took off and it has not stopped. Okay. Well, great to know. I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, while, while, you know, there have been some 
some you know impacts to to general capacity and whatnot it you know, definitely seems like there's been a lot of great movement as well you know to kind of you know help help shippers and help you know the larger you know community of people as well uh so matt kind of a similar question to you you know from coyote shippers in particular using intermodal you know what has the impact you know been on them has it you know been kind of similar to what shauna shauna was mentioning just now yeah it's similar with some uh differences i mean okay. one you can on your customer base as an, as an imc you know we're, we're fortunate here that we have a lot of essential needs shippers that we do business with so for those customers i think intermodal was a was a good early on in the COVID, uh, you know, crisis. Uh, intermodal was a good supply of capacity and volume. Mm -hmm. So, when you talk about how uh, you know overseas and China, especially facilities were shut down, you had Chinese New Year and COVID hitting at the same time. So manufacturers were shut for extended period of time, and there was no there was no imports coming over to be translated on the West Coast. Well, there was more equipment in LA than we knew what to do with. We had plenty of capacity. Mm -hmm. But there were no trucks in LA because you know there no one wanted to go to the West Coast because they couldn't have any, get any freight off there. So intermodal would have been a good, uh, you know, is a good source of capacity. Um, now you look at what uh, what Shauna just mentioned, and, and volumes are through the roof. E-commerce and, and parcel shipments are, are flooding their network, and, and the capacity situation for intermodal is a little bit different. Um, you know, and we can touch on on the importance of being a consistent intermodal shipper in specific corridors later and we talk about strategy, but, you know, it's if you weren't shipping intermodal in the first part of the year, you're definitely not shipping intermodal now because, you know, the trains are sold out, the train is out. So, you know, we, 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 we saw volumes, we did our volumes kind of did the same thing everybody else did. There was a slight downturn in, in you know, kind of early March for us, for example, on COVID, and then they took off. Uh, April is a low point, and then May on, it's been lines been through the roof. So I mean, it's just uh, same same trajectory, just different, uh, kind of a little bit different timing. Gotcha, gotcha. No, it's interesting. I mean, I know there's a you know a lot of moving parts going on, a lot of a lot of you know people having to be nimble, and you know both both yourselves, I'm sure. About to be very nimble with all the changes going on you know on account of the pandemic overall so uh you know i know there's a lot of that a lot of conversation about peak season surcharges i know we're you know i believe we're starting to get into that world now um you know at least from a truckload perspective uh you know i, I know i'm sure this uh, covid 19 pandemic has had something of an effect on it so would love to kind of transition and talk a little bit about that in particular so sean i'll, I'll start with you i mean just Kind of taking a step back, what is uh, intermodal peak season? You know, what what causes it, and you know, when does it usually take place? Yeah, so intermodal peak season really is, you know, let's just call it the busiest time of year, and you know, it typically it, it moves, but let's say it's typically from about mid-August until about about Black Friday. Gotcha. And so it's driven by you know a couple things, a, a little bit by back to school shopping, but really by that holiday season. So as everybody tries to stock up inventories and get ready for you know those Black Friday sales and things like that, um, that's when you see your biggest bump. Now, uh, when you do think about the parcel side of the equation, and their peak season is actually a little bit later. It starts on the tail end of you know retailers peak, and then it really runs until you know the first or second week in January. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so so it, 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 as of now, we're essentially you know heading into 2020 peak season. So, I guess overall, I mean, knowing that the pandemic's thrown off so much this year, and that you know peak season is, you know, as I said, you know, beginning around this time. What is your you know 2020 peak season outlook? You know, what do you see from imports in particular? I know we talked about that a little bit earlier, but would love to yeah. just understand a little bit better. Yeah, so um, what I would say is that we're not heading into peak, uh, we're in peak. No, um, the COVID, you know, the COVID you know, pandemic really had an impact on that. So I'll tell you that for some markets, uh, the spot transactional, for example, we announced peak at the end of July. Gotcha. So, um, so just to clarify there that we're not heading into it, that we are right in the midst of it. But as far as, you know, what's been happening on the import side is I can tell you that imports have been much stronger than they had been in recent months. So there's really minimal to no blank sailing. So a blank sailing is, you know, essentially if a ocean carrier isn't gonna have enough volume, they will cancel um, a sailing of their vessel. 
So you haven't seen really, you know, any of those. Um, from what I'm hearing from the ocean carrier community, vessels have been um, full at capacity. And even a couple ocean carriers have told me that um, they haven't been able to handle everything coming at them overseas. So um, been kind of crazy. Uh, something else we're seeing though, when you think about peak on the domestic side and what probably impacts a lot of the folks on this call is um, we've seen a big trend towards transloading. So uh, obviously transloading had been increasing over the years. So things not moving in intact, um, international intermodal, what we call IPI. Um, we had already been seeing that trend, but I will tell you that with COVID, it has really taken off this year. So we've seen quite a bit more of that and talked to even some shippers that were previously doing primarily, you know, staying intact in the international ocean container that are now transloading. Gotcha. Got, and, and for any, you know, shippers who might not know what, what transloading is, can you just give us a quick overview of what that is? Yeah, so I mean, there's different versions of transloading. Mm -hmm. um, we could be here and I could talk about transloading all day. It's one of my favorite <laughs> topics. But, um, cool. <laughs> and just to keep it simple, like it, it, some, if uh, a box comes over from overseas and, you know, they have certain facilities, for example, called cross dock facilities. So let's say mm -hmm. one of your major retailers has a, you know, several boxes that come over and the, from uh, overseas, but there are boxes of different things. And I'm completely oversimplifying here. But let's say they have a box of lamps, a box of shoes, and a box of pillows, and they take it to this cross dock facility or this transload facility in the, you know, LA Long Beach area, for example, and then they would mix it. So they would say, hey, my store in Chicago, you know, needs X number of lamps, X number of pillows, X number of shoes. And then, you know, the box is loaded in that way so that it can go to the store with everything that particular store needs rather than, you know, moving intact where, you know, maybe a store would wind up with a whole box of pillows, right? Gotcha. Again, totally oversimplified, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes sense, it's cool. Uh, all right, great. So so thank you, Shona, for that. Uh, so I know we've covered a lot of different, you know, nuances with intermodal shipping, you know, seeing as how this is a very different mode from others. I know, you know, there might be some shippers in the, in the larger community that may have some concept, misconceptions about it. So I really want to take some time to debunk some common myths and whatnot with, with intermodal shipping. So uh, in terms of this world map, I'll start with you. What are some of the most common misconceptions that you come across from shippers? You know, what, what, are, those, what are those myths that, that you hear? I mean, I, probably the most, uh, the biggest one we hear all the time and, and maybe even probably one of the most frustrating ones on our side is a lot of shippers don't think they can ship intermodal to their customers direct. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, they, you've got the big retailers up there with fining structures where if you're late, they fine. You know, if you're early, they fine. Your scores go down. Your on-time performance goes down. Your invoices get docked for a quarter or even, you know, however long. But, you know, there, there are a lot of shippers that just refuse to take that chance and that risk shipping to their customers direct. I mean, you know, what we tell a lot of those shippers is, you know, while the railroad, it's not a truck, so service is a little bit lower. You know, the service levels overall are lower than a truck would be. But when you look at them, you know, they're, you know, what we do, we build, we get, we quote a transit time to every customer. And our transit times are usually, you know, days on the rail plus, or you know, plus, you know, X amount of time for the inconsistency of rail, the rail schedule or rail service. But we can usually give the shipper and you know or the receiver in this case whoever the customer is for us a a transit time for that corridor that ramp pair you know origin destination that's going to allow them to deliver 90 92 93 95 percent plus on time so probably the biggest myth for me is i can't go direct to my customer due to service so as long as the transit time is allowable there is a transit time out there that takes those service uh fluctuations out of uh you know, it, it, it smooths them out. It makes them more consistent. Uh, the next one's damaged for me. The myth is uh, I put it on a container, got damaged. If you block and brace the load properly, unless it's just something that should not be in riding on a container, you know, damage is really minimal. Uh, we, we do have claims, but it's it's no, it's no not any more than so than we have on trucks. So, you know, from our brokerage perspective. So for me, those are, those are probably the two biggest myths. Um, and, and that's ones that we, we work with customers on to solve, but that, that's probably the two I run into the most about intermodal. Gotcha. Gotcha. Shona, any, anything that you've heard in the, in the, in the marketplace as well, or something similar to, to, to Matt? 
Yeah, so I would say that those are really the two big ones. But okay. uh, the other things I'll mention is when people think about rail, they think they need to be located on rail. And that's like precisely what intermodal does, right? Is that bridges that gap. So on the car load side, um, so some of our other commodities, you do need to be have your facility located on rail. But in intermodal, because of that dray piece that Matt went through earlier, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. again, you don't need to be located on a rail. And then another one is just that it's complex. So you hear from a lot of people, oh, that's just too hard. It's really easy to just, you know, stick it on a truck and go. But really the IMC community, like Matt, make that mm -hmm. so much easier on shippers. So again, it kind of is the same thing where, you know, you put it in the hands of the IMC and, and the underlying shipper, you know, doesn't have that complexity to deal with. Oh, that makes sense. And, and I'd add, so, and you reminded me, Sean, it was a complexity, blocking embracing, the myth of blocking embracing is, uh, I think some shippers tend to overcomplicate it. They expect, they think the railroads expect you to build a playhouse in the bag of container. Um, you know, it's really easy to to work with an IMC and the railroads to have people come out to your facilities and work with you on blocking and bracing. And, and I have never, you know, I've been doing, involved in intermodal for over 18 years now. I've never seen a loading pattern too complex and too expensive to where it makes intermodal a, a non-viable solution for a shipper. Yep, exactly. Gotcha. No, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so as we uh, as we transition here, this is, this is a good this is a good question to throw over to you guys as we move on to the next thing. It just I'd love to talk strategy and, and implementation, and obviously would love to you know kind of take us out here uh, with some takeaways that our audience can build on their strategies overall. So we, we heard about, you know, all the foundational material, all about, you know, some of those myths that, you know, really are, you know, are definitely, you know, fixable and, and, and that, that, you know, shippers can, can work against. So what would, what do you want shippers to know, you know when they start to integrate intermodal into their business strategy? You know, Matt, I'll start with you on this. You know, the biggest thing for, for shippers is, you know, I think a lot of shippers tend to overcomplicate it and use too many providers. I mean, as Sean mentioned earlier when talking about rates, there, there is a there's a volume component to being able to get locked in pricing within our model. So I, I would say for the most part, carrier selection is important, um, provider selection. So when you're developing your strategy, you obviously need to determine who you want to work with, you know, how how big is that service provider? How big is their network? Where, what are their strong points from a network perspective? So when I, when I talk about network perspective, I would say, you know, if you're shipping out of Los Angeles, is that provider shipping equipment into Los Angeles that they can, that they can turn on the street for you and commit to you, or are you going to be solely reliant on the railroad supplying that equipment? Uh, so really no different than on the truckload side under understanding where where is your capacity coming from and where is it where is it going um and and then just comes down to to service are they are they are they actually dealing with the drayman and the railroads direct or are they a broker brokering their intermodal load to another imc who is then coordinating the intermodal move. Uh, that, that's some things you really need to think about when, when developing your strategy and from a carrier selection. Uh, the next part would be, uh, you know, do I want to use asset based carriers or do I want to use non asset based carriers? And then I would say, like anything, again, you know, vet your carriers, understand what you need. There is a there's obviously an advantage to asset carriers in the in the network or they wouldn't exist. And there's an advantage to non asset based carriers and therefore they wouldn't exist. No different than an asset-based trucking company versus a broker. Uh, we each have our strong points. We each have our, our needs. I would say that uh, you know when selecting carriers, you need to probably have some kind of mixture of asset and not asset-based carriers. But again, you got to keep in mind how much volume are you actually going to be shipping. If you're a shipper that's only going to ship 200 loads a year, then you're going to have different carrier needs from your strategy perspective as someone that ships you know 30,000 loads a year. Um, you know, taking into consideration, uh, you know, what's your, what's your network as a shipper? So what does my network look like? Am I shipping out of one single location going to one single customer? Or am I shipping out of 15 or 20 locations across the country going into, you know, hundreds of receivers? Um, that's going to determine your strategy. Uh, but, you know, from the biggest part of it overall is, you know, mileage. Uh, when you're trying to determine truck versus intermodal is, you know, I wouldn't really start looking at intermodal till you get up to that 650, 700 mile range, unless you're shipping from Miami to Jacksonville 
you know, which is only going to be, you know, 350 miles uh, where the FEC exists. But, you know, for the most part, intermodal is not competitive with truckload unless you get up to that, you know, 700, 750 miles. The longer you're going, the more competitive intermodal gets. Um, that, that's what you need to consider. If you don't have lanes that are over 700 miles, you probably don't have a lot of opportunity for intermodal. Um, you know, in that all, but again, that's all depending on what truckload pricing is doing, what's truckload capacity doing. You know, a lot of people look at intermodal as just a cost savings mode. It's also capacity. So a lot of shippers on the East Coast are impacted by produce every year. Mm -hmm. uh, capacity gets tight. If you're a shipper shipping off the East Coast, I would say, hey, you know, I've got 20 loads a week. Maybe I should uh, contract 15 of them truck and five of them intermodal, even though intermodal is a little bit more expensive. But at least you got that that capacity that should be there through through produce season for you. There's a, there's a lot of different things about when considering strategy. Uh, we could probably do an entire 45 minute session. But I would, you know, carrier selections big. What is my network? like how many miles am I what's what's my length of haul um gotcha. and then um you know rfps you know rfps are not like again we talked earlier about how fragmented the truckload market is compared to intermodal you really only have you know shauna mentioned seven class one railroads um that provide intermodal services you know for most shippers you're only going to touch you know up to probably four of them you know depending on how big your network are mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, bids are a part of your strategy. You know, do you bid or do you not bid? Um, that's going to depend on, you know, obviously decisions to bid are driven by, you know, from the top down. Uh, most people do RFPs every year. Uh, intermodal is a is a 12 month contract. So RFPs need to be lined up with 12 month contracts. But at the same time, there is an advantage to not doing a bid and just negotiating with, with the carriers. I mean, as long as the carriers are doing a good job for you, there's really no need to bid out intermodal because the pricing is going to be renewed with the railroad no matter what every 12 months and it's going to be market-based what's going on so you know i've seen customers do bids and it ends up hurting them i've seen customers not do bids and it ends up hurting them so i mean it's just it's it depends on the individual uh individual shipper and what they what they need to do yeah i would layer onto that and just say um it's kind of your risk appetite right so Mm -hmm. um, like we talked a little bit about the committed program earlier. Uh, if you have are somebody that has year round volume, you may be better off entering into a committed program where then you are assured capacity and also have stable pricing. Whereas you find people that, especially like when you think about the market this year and what happened, you know, as things picked up, yeah. um, some of the shutdown, you know, people found themselves without options and or paying you know, significantly higher prices for options. So that's something else I would just layer on is, you know, think about your, your risk appetite. If uh, your risk appetite's not big, you should probably consider um, entering into a committed program with the railroad and your IMC. Yeah, and just to add to the, the pricing side of it and the bid side of that is, is intermodal pricing is going to reflect the truckload market, you know, outside of the timing piece. So if the market changes mid, mid are you know if you have a 12 month commitment and the market changes six months in you're going to either be protected or you're going to be at a disadvantage on the committed pricing part but follow what the truck load market is doing because it is a it is a the intermodal product is mm -hmm. a service offering you know less than truck but better you know from a speed standpoint but better than than car load gotcha. um, so there's going to be some fluctuation in pricing so that again that's whether the bid or not, it all depends on the market and what you want to do. Uh, but you're always, and in, in my opinion, you're always better if you have the volume to be running on committed rates versus transactional rates. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, all right. Well, cool. Well, I, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I'd like to thank you guys you know, so much for, for taking the time to, to speak with us about this topic. Uh, and thank you to everyone in our audience who attended this session of the Coyote Logistics Digital Summit. Uh, you can access all of the Digital Summit sessions on demand, as well as helpful content about intermodal shipping and other industry uh, insights uh, in the Coyote Resources Center uh, at coyote.com. So once again, thanks so much, everybody, for joining, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.